What's up everybody, this is your boy Kamal once again, and today we have a very special integral. It's actually a trip down memory lane for me, because it's the integral I used to teach myself Feynman's trick in the first place. And I made a video solving this integral using Feynman's trick a long while ago. And it was one of those first few videos of mine that actually blew up, but I didn't like the video about two or three months after uploading it. I really just didn't like it, so... I want to record the solution development again, but I want to explain it much better than I did last time. So this is the integral from 0 to 1 of log 1 plus x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. This is actually an A5 Putnam problem. So as expected, it's a pretty cool integration problem here. And there are a couple of ways to solve it using trigonometric substitutions, but I believe a Feynman's trick approach here is both very efficient and very cool. So here's the deal. We're going to solve the integral by defining an integral function i of some parameter alpha. And we'll define it in this case as the integral from 0 to 1 of log 1 plus alpha x. So I'm placing the parameter as part of the argument of the logarithm function as a coefficient of x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. Now, what exactly is the motivation for placing the alpha parameter there? Well, our target integral i is the integral function evaluated at alpha equal to 1. And another reason is that if I use alpha equal to 0, I get the integral from 0 to 1 of log 1 divided by 1 plus x squared dx, and log 1 is 0. So the entire thing just collapses to 0. So we have a very convenient initial condition, that is i of 0 equals 0. And that's enough information we need for now. So the entire point of solving an integral by Feynman's trick means we differentiate under the integral sign. So we're differentiating with respect to the alpha parameter. But the whole thing about differentiating under the integral sign means we have to take the differentiation operator inside the integration operator. We want to switch up of the two operators, that is. And that's only valid, mathematically speaking, when the integral function actually converges for values of our alpha parameter. And here, if I take alpha to be non-negative, so that I include both the target case of alpha being equal to 1, as well as the initial condition of i of 0 being 0, then we see that we have a bounded function of both alpha and x being integrated over a bounded interval. So bounded function being integrated over a bounded, integral, a bounded interval means that the integral will converge. So the switch up is completely valid. We can in fact perform the switch up. And because of that, we have the integral from zero to one of the partial derivative with respect to alpha of log one plus alpha x divided by one plus x squared dx. So we're differentiating partially with respect to alpha, meaning that the 1 by 1 plus x squared term is going to be held as a constant. So we have 1 by 1 plus x squared. And what's the derivative of the logarithm? That would be the reciprocal of the argument. And the derivative of 1 plus alpha x with respect to alpha would be x. Okay, cool. So now we have this modified integrand, that is x divided by... 1 plus alpha x divided by 1 plus x squared dx. That's the derivative of i with respect to alpha. And this integral looks a lot more hospitable because immediately we see that all we need is a partial fraction decomposition. So let's perform that real quick. We have our partial fraction decomposition. We have x divided by 1 plus alpha x times 1 plus x squared equal to a divided by 1 plus alpha x plus for the quadratic term in the denominator we need bx plus c so there's a linear term divided by 1 plus x squared moving stuff around gives us x equal to a times 1 plus x squared plus bx plus c times 1 plus alpha x so let's first assume that x equals negative 1 by alpha. That, that way the linear term will go to 0. So that means we have negative 1 by alpha equal to a times 1 plus 1 
by alpha squared, which of course can be written as one plus alpha squared divided by alpha squared plus a big fat zero. So the alpha terms cancel out quite nicely. And this means that a equals negative alpha divided by one plus alpha squared. Now for the values of b and c, we could just compare coefficients or we could even use some arbitrary values of x because this equation is valid for all values of x. So let's start with x equal to zero. That seems pretty convenient because we have zero equal to a times one, which is just negative alpha divided by one plus alpha squared. B times zero is zero and alpha times zero is zero as well. So that was pretty convenient. We have C equal to what exactly that's alpha divided by one plus alpha squared. And now for the B coefficient, we might as well compare coefficients here. Uh, what exactly, let's compare the coefficients of X squared. So that would be A plus B times alpha, correct? So we have A plus alpha B equal to the coefficient of X squared on the left-hand side was zero. So we have B equal to negative A by alpha, which would give me one by one plus alpha squared. Okay, cool. And this implies the derivative of I with respect to alpha equals the integral from zero to one of the uppercase a term was negative alpha divided by what exactly? That was one plus alpha squared times one by one plus alpha x plus bx plus c. Now b here is one by alpha squared and the x term goes here with the one by x squared term in the denominator. And c here was alpha divided by one plus alpha squared times once again the reciprocal of one plus x squared integration with respect to x. So we have three fairly simple integrals, rather really simple integrals to evaluate. We're integrating with respect to x, so all the alpha terms are just constants here. So we have, let me just perform all the integrations right away. Negative alpha divided by one plus alpha squared and the antiderivative of one by one plus alpha x is in fact log one plus alpha x divided by alpha, some nice cancellation happening straight away, plus we need a factor of two here and here for the antiderivative. So that's one half, one by one plus alpha squared, log one plus x squared. And finally, we have alpha divided by one plus x squared times the inverse tangent of x with the limits being zero and one. Now in the limit as x tends to zero, all we have are log ones and an inverse tangent of zero. And all those terms give us zero. So everything collapses in that limit as x approaches zero and as x approaches one, we have negative log one plus alpha divided by one plus alpha squared plus one half or one by two times one plus alpha squared. That is terribly, sorry about that. And we have log two here and then we have alpha divided by one plus alpha squared inverse tangent of one is pi by four. And this here is the derivative of i with respect to alpha, which is cool, but we're interested in solving for the actual integral function and then plugging in the required value of alpha. So our plan here is to recover back the integral function. And how exactly do we do that given its derivative? Well, that's easy. We just have to integrate with respect to alpha. Oh wait, terribly sorry about that. Much better. And here we go. And we could use an indefinite integral here, but I'm gonna make use of a definite integral. I'm gonna be integrating from zero to one. And the reason for that is, well, zero is the initial value for the integral function given. We know that I of zero is zero and I of one is our target case. So on the left-hand side, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, we have I of one, minus i of zero. And on the right hand side, notice that we have negative i of one. That's exactly what our target integral is with a dummy variable na named alpha instead of x. So that's another convenient thing we have going on. Then finally we have log two divided by two times the integral from zero to one of d alpha divided by one plus alpha squared plus 
pi by 4 times the integral from 0 to 1 of alpha divided by 1 plus alpha squared d alpha. So i of 0 is just 0, and expanding using i of 1, we have 2 times i equal to log 2 divided by 2 times the inverse tangent of alpha with the limits being 0 and 1 plus pi by 4 times 1 half of log 1 plus alpha squared with the limits being 0 and 1. That means we have pi by 8 times log 2 plus pi by 8 times, again, log 2. And all of this implies that the target integral, that is the integral from 0 to 1, of the logarithm of 1 plus x squared divided by, no, it was 1 plus x terribly, sorry about that, divided by 1 plus x squared dx equals pi by 8 times log 2. And that was an extremely cool solution development. I hope you found this video useful. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram and support the channel if you want on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.